five for three. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. I have three terrific guests with me. And before I start and introduce them, I would like to just mention that my friend Larry Beinhart, who wrote Wag the Dog, has a new book out, which was just published, called The Librarian. For anyone who's interested in an election being stolen by one party, and wants to read a terrific read, this is the book to buy this year. Uh, Hamilton Fish, who is a well-known person in Dutchess County where I take my show, he is, has published, his company has published this, the Nation Institute. And I sincerely hope that all of you will buy this book and read it because fiction is sometimes closer to the truth than we ever would believe. Um, for all of you out there who stopped me on the street and in the mall and asked me about my TV show um, and how much money I make doing it, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. Uh, neither I nor any of my guests receive any remuneration whatsoever for appearing on this television show. It is sim simply volunteer work and I always appreciate the people who take time out of their busy day to come and be on the show to speak the truth about what's going on in the courts and what's going on in areas that our media does not cover today. That's why I'm here, and that's why these gentlemen are here with me. Um, what I do for a living, I write books and I distribute books to stores throughout the Hudson Valley. You know, many of you might know the Hudson Valley and Catskill Mountains, which is my guidebook to the region. And of course, those of you who have been watching this show for six years now, you also know about the joy of divorce. There is no joy. It is a miserable thing. And with that, I'd like to introduce my first guest, my former custody attorney in Ulster County, who practices at McCabe and Mack in Dutchess County, Phil Schatz. Hello. Thank you for joining me, yeah, Phil. A pleasure, Joanne. And for those of you who've seen me on national TV, you've also seen Ralph Beisner on Donahue and Geraldo many years ago. And thank you for joining me, Ralph. Really, I appreciate it. Uh, Ralph was a Supreme Court judge in Dutchess County and he is now retired. How many years? Two years. Oh, it's been two years already. Well, I guess I've been divorced now almost nine. And last but not least is Paul Gruner. And Paul Gruner is an attorney in, uh, was an attorney in Ulster County and is now, was appointed by Governor Pataki to fill a surrogate court position in our county. He is doing an excellent job. He is respected and really revered by both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. And I'd like to welcome Paul to my show. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm working, I am a registered Democrat, and I am working for Paul Gruner this November. And I am working very, very hard um, against his, uh, for him and against his opponent, Mary Work, who is a Democrat. Um, one of the things I would like to do is I would like to ask Paul how he got to be surrogate judge, and secondly, what is a surrogate judge? Well, <laughs> as you alluded to in the opening remarks, um, I, was, uh, I appeared before a bipartisan judicial screening committee uh, that is set up uh, to screen candidates to fill vacancies. Um, Following that screening, my name was passed along to the governor, and the governor uh, nominated me to uh, fill the vacancy of uh, Judge Traficani, who had resigned, uh, effective, I believe, it was April 1st. Um, following that, uh, there was a hearing before the New York State Senate Judicial Committee, uh, and they va voted uh, my nomination favorably to the floor of the, of the New York State Senate where the Senate uh, confirmed my nomination. So that was the process uh, that I went through to obtain the appointment from the governor. Uh, what is the surrogate court? The surrogate court is the court which uh, deals with estates, trusts, guardianships, adoptions, um, and the surrogate court judge not only uh, is expected to handle all of that work in Ulster County, 
uh, but also to be a trial judge in the other uh, trial level courts, that being the county court where your serious felony offenses are dealt with, as well as Supreme Court um, where the Supreme Court being the trial level court for, in our district, civil cases, uh, and also to help out in family court. So that uh, will be the task of the surrogate court judge, and that's what I'm doing right now. I see. And how long have you been an attorney in Ulster County? I was admitted to the bar in February of 1974, um, so I've been a practicing attorney in Ulster County. Since then, I've also held various positions uh, in the First in the district attorney's office, uh, I was the chief assistant district attorney uh, under Mike Cavanaugh, and then um, in 1980 became the chief public defender for the county and maintained that position until I was appointed to the bench. And I also maintained, uh, since both of those positions, uh, the district attorney at the time and public defender still is a part-time position, uh, I maintained a, a private practice as well. Oh, you do? Yes. Okay. Are you a local person? Did you grow up in Kingston? I grew up in Ulster County. Uh, my roots are, uh, my father, father's father owned a um, f apple and grape farm in Highland, um, and uh, he moved to Kingston uh, after he was discharged in World War II, became a teacher in the Kingston School District, and I grew up in the um, Kingston area. I see. And one of the things when I read information about you that I discovered was uh, you and I have the same alma mater, the University of Connecticut. Uh, I graduated there in 72, and I think you graduated there a few years early, 1968, right? yes. Okay, that's when I am. The so dark ages. I, mi I missed you running around that wonderful campus, which is totally transformed since yes. we were there, I might mm -hmm. add. Um, so you graduated in 1972? Yes. Wow. <coughs> I thought you were much younger than that, John. Oh, I guess that's, a, that's either an, a left-handed compliment or an insult. <laughs> Lori's trying to put the distance and age on me. Oh, oh, oh right. Well, I mean, the w gentlemen, I know it's really bad, but women who are in their 50s have a bad rap, but I'm going to be 54 in a few months, and life has never been better. So I wish I could say that, Joey. <laughs> well, yours, listen, you go to work every day, and what are you, almost 80? I mean, I'm amazed. 78. 78. Well, I hope I, my mind is as good when I'm 78 as yours. I mean, really, you've, you're very, very amazing and very, very impressive. Um, but anyway, I guess what I was, uh, was curious about is, um, I think, now, uh, your opponent has, is a judge in family court, is that correct? Mary correct. Work? Okay, a Democrat from, uh, I believe, Ulster County, also the southern part of the county, yes. Walkell area. Um, it's very difficult as a, as a layperson um, to make a decision about a judge I, I, uh, voting, when you're voting. You go in the voting booth like I do, and I look and I say, hey, um, I'm a Democrat, there's a Democratic woman on the ticket and there's a Republican man, I guess I should vote for the Democratic woman because I don't know what these people do. Um, that seems to be, gentlemen, I'm addressing this to all of you, what a lot of people do. The only reason I know Mary Work is because I was a litigant in her court, and I'll leave it at that. But, um, and, and I'm working very, very hard for Mr. Gruner so that everybody out there who's a Democratic woman like I am understands why they should vote for him. Now, can I well, ask you... No, stop, uh, Julie. Yeah. Let me say uh, that I have never known a litigant who did not get exactly what they wanted, who did not feel that uh, perhaps the judge could have done better. I agree. Uh, this is a, 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 a tough area. Uh, judges have to make their calls, and sometimes uh, you disagree with them, but when your own personal philosophy is involved and your own personal uh, results are involved, and it doesn't go just the way you want, uh, there is an absolute natural tendency to say, that judge was wrong. But in every case, somebody wins and somebody loses, and you have to accept that. And uh, judges are, to my knowledge, in this area at least, are of good character and good intentions. Do they make mistakes? Of course. That's why you have appellate courts. 
but the uh, right. So people appeal the decisions like I did, and yeah. I won in the higher court. Okay, Let me but ask that doesn't something. make uh, the judge a bad no, person no, no, no. I a did, bad judge. Did I uh, say anybody was no. a bad person? I of course just, not. I, I no, did, I just, I I just wanted that. to get never. the record straight. <laughs> on okay, this issue. absolutely, and your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. um, Ralph Beisner, you're a judge. You've sat in the hot seat there. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be in in these courts? particularly divorce court, where, or even financial things like surrogate, where you have to make decisions about assets. It's See, difficult, isn't so it? You have to. I was a judge for 18 years, Supreme Court, and um, I sat in many matrimonial cases. You have to remember our American judicial system is an adversarial system. And uh, each side has an opportunity to present their perspective on the facts of the case. What is the truth? You know, they pres each, each uh, person puts in their version of the truth. And, and their then, lawyer puts it in. Yeah. And, and whoever the, can afford the best lawyer. And then the judge, then the judge has, has the uh, obligation to, to determine as best they are able to what is the truth and render a decision. And I have to agree with uh, Mr. Schatz that most times neither side is particularly thrilled with the decision made by the judge. and uh, and and. They both, if, if you can, as a judge, have one side like what you did, it's really a, uh, it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, neither side like what the judge has, has done. That's why I've always uh, been an advocate of settling matrimonial cases, because at least then everybody walks away uh, reasonably satisfied with the result that occurred. I see. But, but we always have to remember that tension of an adversarial judicial system, and the judge is the final arbiter of that, right. uh, of that um, process. I, you've raised another question, and w the question I have is, behind closed doors in these courtrooms, very few people besides the litigants know exactly what happened. And as you say, even then, if you were to hear their side, the opponent's side, wh what the truth is is questionable, granted. However, I have been doing this television show, producing and hosting the show, for si almost six years now. And I would like to tell the people out there that over and over again, there are a few judges' names that continually come up, repeatedly, from the f dozens of phone calls I get every month, and the names come up. Now, what I'm asking you <coughs> is, I'm not going to mention any names, but I, w I would like to ask you, I feel it is my civic responsibility on this television show to address that and to also address the people whose names come up as good people. And those are the people I generally have well, on my show. Well, you have to yeah. understand, and it, again, uh, Mr. Gruner or Judge Gruner is under a restraint because any sitting judge right. cannot ethically uh, comment on their opponent. No, no, I and understand. And or any matter that may come before their court. The only thing he's allowed to do as he, as he mm -hmm. campaigns would be to say, this is my experience and I would like you to vote for me based upon my experience and my qualifications right. for the position. Now, well, in, his case, in his case, he's, had, he's already been vetted, so to speak, by, by, the uh, by the governor and by the legislature. So he's gone through probably a more uh, strict screening process than most judges who end up in I elective see. processes. Uh, and he's been found qualified to, to, uh, to run for the particular office or to actually to be in that office. But what we try to do in the judicial system by limiting what a judge can say is have people vote for the qualifications of the person they're voting for as opposed to voting against somebody else. But isn't it true that these are political, in other words, my feeling is judges shouldn't be in parties, Republican and Democrat, they should be individuals, X person and Y person with their name with no party. Because well, the fact of the matter is, though, that's something for the future. We're yeah. dealing with the Art. present. Uh -huh. And the present system uh, requires that a judicial candidate uh, run with a party designation or run as a right as an independent but let me just address something you brought up about clients or um, people going to court with their attorneys uh, the attorneys going into chambers uh, and discussing the case and the clients not participating in that 
Uh, since I've been on the bench, I've had occasion to uh, conduct conferences and cases, uh, to conduct conferences in some fairly significant matters in surrogate court, and I've required, in most instance, instances, the, uh, the clients to be there. Uh, on each occasion where I have required the clients to be there, if we have had significant discussions in chambers, I always go out on the bench and go on the record and tell mm -hmm. the litigants what was discussed in chambers, what, if anything, was resolved in chambers, and whether they had any questions of their lawyers or myself as to anything that occurred outside of their presence. And I think that is a very important uh, aspect of conferencing cases. Now, in a lot of cases, and Judge Beisner can tell you, uh, as well as Mr. Schatz, that uh, a lot of conferences, although the court may require the presence of uh, the client, are routine procedural, or, or routine procedural matters are discussed and resolved, such as what we uh, attorneys would call scheduling matters. In other words, you set up a mm -hmm. schedule of one certain procedural aspects of a, a, a case maybe must be accomplished by, and that is uh, put into the form of an order. Uh, I don't think any judge goes out on the bench and puts uh, on the record what was discussed there. Uh, however, if there are significant um, issues that are discussed and perhaps resolved in some form or another, uh, again, it's always my practice to go out so that the litigants know what happened uh, in chambers. Okay, uh, that is, I am so glad you raised that and I'll tell you why. If you ha are out there watching this and you have <clears throat> never been in court, which most of my friends, my parents, people who were listening to my story when I was in court, it was very confusing and upsetting to have decisions made when I was not present. Exactly what you're saying. This happens to be, I'm glad to hear you do that. And all of you out there should be glad to hear but it. Joanne, what? There's, there's another side to this. You know, litigants have a paranoia and they have to because they are fighting usually for something very urgent to them. Well, they're Whether, not lawyers. They don't understand no, the language. I understand. Okay. But uh, that, that inherent fear of what's going to happen, the inherent lack of knowledge, puts them in a terrible position and everything is suspect. But, you know, the uh, judges are decent people, they are well trained, and every judge who sits on the bench has gone through a screening committee of uh, lawyers who found them qualified or uh, they would not be uh, sitting or running, at least in this area. Uh, so that. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing, and judge bashing is so easy for a losing litigant to do, but you have to accept they've got the lousiest job in the world. They make decisions that really go to people's lives, whether it be financial or whether it be in terms of family. I don't envy uh, the judges. I admire them for what they have to put up with and for the difficulty of making the decisions. And I clerked for a judge in my younger years. And I want to tell you, that is not an easy job. I, no I, one is I saying it is. But if you to, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. I have to. Uh, that's really I have to. It, uh, it was my observation uh, during the years, and Phil was in private practice and represented uh, clients in front of me, as did uh, Judge Gruner uh, when he was in private practice. And it always seemed to me, particularly in matrimonial cases, when I would render a decision that, and one party liked it, the attorney would say, I did a really good job. And if the side <laughs> didn't like it, they said, boy, that judge really screwed up that case, you know? So, <laughs> so uh, the negative always fell to the judge, the positive fell to the attorney. Right. right. No, and that's one true. of the things that, uh, you know, I, uh, in terms of my qualifications, uh, one of the things that uh, I would like the public to know is that I represented clients for 30 years. I litigated cases in the courts that I'm expected to sit in. Uh, I've tried over probably 250 serious felony cases. Uh, I've appeared and tried cases, uh, I can't even tell you, 300, 400 cases in the Supreme Court. And <clears throat> as a result of doing that over, and, and also a significant number of cases in, in the court in which I sit. but. What I would like to bring to the bench, based on that experience, is the client's perspective. Uh, and I've been on the winning side, and I've been on the losing side. 
And uh, I understand, as uh, Judge Beisner just uh, indicated, and uh, uh, it, that is the perspective of the client. Um, and there has to be, in my opinion, an understanding of the perspective of the client from the bench. Uh, and that's one of the uh, factors that I believe is critical to my candidacy uh, and, frankly, one of the reasons I'm seeking the position. I, well, just so everybody out there knows, um, I really did not know you at all um, before the start of this campaign. And I have talked to I would say dozens of people throughout Ulster County about you. And everybody, everybody, whether they were Democrats or Republicans, has spoken exceedingly highly of your qualifications and of the work you have done in our county. Um, that makes mo me very happy because I'm the repository of many sad stories from clients um, about these very things that you have addressed. So I'm glad to see that you are interested in that aspect of your work, of, of getting the client um, more involved. Uh, I also know that Curran and Gruner, your law firm, during the period of time I've been doing this uh, show, um, I have heard very, very good things about your work as uh, in the divorce attorney area, whatever you call it, matrimonial. Well, area. I did, yes, I did do um, matrimonial work over the years, um, but I engaged in other aspects of uh, general practice as well. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the cases that I appeared in front of uh, Judge Beisner on were uh, negligence cases or in one case a wrongful death case. Um, I didn't do everything but uh, I limited my practice basically to about five areas. But again, what, I, what I'm telling the people of Ulster County is that one of the, the or, or my major emphasis is uh, to bring that experience in representing clients uh, before the various courts that the surrogate will be expected to try cases in front of uh, is to bring the client's perspective, to bring uh, the the lawyer's perspective, mm -hmm. and understand. I, I think I have a very good understanding uh, of that perspective or those perspectives. Uh, having done it for 30 years, my major emphasis, I, I'm a, I was a litigator. Uh, I appeared in court and I tried cases. Uh, that's not the only thing I did, but uh, um, that's what I bring to the bench, the experience in those courts. And, what do you and like I will say to? that's no small uh, statement either that he makes. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Schatz and I were both discussing that one of the strengths of the judiciary in the Hudson Valley is that the judges do come out of the private practice and have experience representing clients uh, as opposed to someone who's come through an administrative process and gets a, becomes a judge and, and it does not When you have say the administrative process, what exactly do you mean? Well, Give me an example of that kind uh, of person. They may, they may have uh, been appointed to a, uh, a lower court or a like lower administrative court? position. No, of we're talking more about people that come out of the justice courts I see. and then uh, work their way up. But, uh, I see, and they, they have been appointed but to But they a don't service. actually represent clients in front of the courts. I see. And mm -hmm. if you, it, it, it changes your whole perspective on, on the, the ability of the judge and the function of the judge. And I think when a judge, when a, when a person has done that and then becomes a judge, they are so much more uh, qualified and uh, able to make the system function I for see. the benefit of both the attorneys and the litigants. It's, that's a, it's that's a very, okay. trem it's a tremendous asset. Let that's me give great. you an yeah. equivalent. Yeah, because it it's be, confusing. Uh, can you picture somebody becoming a football coach who never played football? And until you've been in the combat, until you have uh, been in the interaction of uh, a trial, uh, as a litigant's attorney, uh, you get a perspective that somebody who has never done it uh, cannot have or understand. I see. Exactly. Well, one of the things, I mean, we've, we've been discussing such serious matters, but the show is wrapping up soon, and I, I sort of wanted to have an idea of, uh, like, what do you like to do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> I know well, you like your work. You Ralph can tell us I, what you like best about it. But uh, uh, Judge Beisner and I are golf partners, and we enjoy getting out, getting a chance to uh, 
enjoy God's temple, which is uh, what the outside is. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and... Uh, I guess that's why I'm going to take up golf, golf when I golf, die. We're golf <laughs> partners since I retired. I want to make that clear. Right, right. <laughs> well, we all know about you people having lunch together. We all joke about that when we're litigants. Yeah, they screwed us, but then they went out and had lunch together. But what do you like best to do um, well, in your free time, and what do you like best about your job? I believe guess. it or not, I... I, I also like to play golf, but there's a couple of things that give me great enjoyment. And um, one of them, quite frankly, is just working around my yard. I really enjoy the peace. Uh, that Where do you live now? I live in Stone Ridge. And mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, other than this year when I'm running around the county, um, I take care of my gardens. I take care of my lawn. Uh, you know, I take care of my stone walls. Uh, and I find a great deal of uh, uh, peace comes to me as a result of that. The other thing I really enjoy is that uh, I have uh, two students or two children in college, um, one of whom plays college football. And um, where uh, he he's at Hobart College in Geneva, New York, and my daughter is at Cornell. Um, and after I pay their tuition bills, um, I have. Uh, enough money to go visit them and that's about <laughs> it but um, I really enjoy um, going to visit them in college and also going to watch my son uh, play college football and then I have another one who is a senior in high school uh, he plays uh, football for Rhonda Valley Rhonda. and I enjoy just uh, going and watching the games and relaxing at the games oh, and what do you the other thing I, I wanted to ask you is what do you like best about your job the I mean, I'm trying to understand now as a surrogate, I guess. Well, um, what I like best about the job uh, is, as Judge Beisner indicated, particularly with respect to the matrimonials, but also with any type of case, and he could certainly speak to this uh, as Mr. Schatz could as well. I think the, the, the best thing a judge can do uh, prior to stepping into that courtroom and going to trial is to exhaust every possible avenue to settle a case and to try to bring the litigants to a common ground. It's always better if people can settle and, and they feel that they have at least agreed upon uh, whatever resolution there may be in a particular case rather than, as Judge Beisner said, have the judge decide and have maybe one side be happy or maybe the other side be unhappy or uh, in many, many cases where neither side is happy. Um, Most cases. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> I have found in my, you know, since I've been on the bench that, uh, I'll give you an example. We have an estate pending in, in the surrogate court right now uh, where there are still uh, there is still a significant aspect of the case pending, but the Supreme Court referred two companion cases to the surrogate court. We worked all day trying to resolve those two cases, and at the end of the day we were able to do that. And throughout the day, as I indicated, and, and again, this is something I'm, uh, I'm going to continue to do, I went out on the bench and I talked to the litigants uh, about what was going on so that they didn't feel all of this was behind closed doors. Um, so that has been very rewarding to me and that's not obviously the only case that I've done quite frankly. I've, I've sat on a couple of uh, family court matters uh, where nothing is done behind closed doors. The conferencing goes on right in the courtroom and I think as a result of a couple of those cases the litigants understood why certain things had to be done. Uh, and it, it makes it easier on them uh, perhaps to come to a resolution, to come to a settlement. Um, so and, you, and, yeah. so and so far, and I, and I have tried cases. I've already tried probably three or four criminal cases, which uh, you know, are felony cases. There, it's, uh, you know, that's, a, that's different. Can I get uh, one plug in, Paul? The one thing that I always hope judges will do and understand is there are some matters that go before the court on papers and uh, justice delayed is justice denied and I always uh, try to speak to the issue of uh, reasonably prompt disposition of uh, issues that are brought before the court on papers as distinguished from uh, litigation. They're usually preliminary. Sometimes they're judgmental to finish Accusations, a case. Right? No, no. Or you can have motions for motions. summary judgment mm -hmm. or 
uh, motions to preclude, motions that have great effect, but if they sit too long, uh, again, uh, justice delayed to me is justice denied, and the one thing I always uh, try to get across is how important it is for the courts to move with reasonable speed, not well, unreasonable speed, but I, reasonable speed. With that, I will say that we, we do have to close the show. Our time is up. I want to thank all three of you for joining me. I know you're all very busy, and you're all very good at what you do. And I would urge everybody who's watching in Ulster County to vote for Mr. Gruner on November 2nd. Thank you very much for joining me, and good night. Where we going? Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Joanne Michaels Show. And tonight I have with me Del Seligman, an attorney from Kingston and Manhattan. She has practice in both places. Um, her address is 70 Main Street, which is where my friend John Hurd used to live. And unfortunately, he's in L.A. now making movies, and he wasn't able to join us today. Uh, the other person who wasn't able to join us is John Chase, who was on his way from Manhattan, but got caught in a backup of traffic. So we will have to um, discuss what I know about his case, which he has told me in great detail. He is a litigant in Judge Paul Chaika's court in Columbia County, and Paul Chaika is being opposed this year by a woman named Pam Jorn, a Democrat, and she has been endorsed by many Republicans in Columbia County one of whom is John Chase, and he's a Republican working on her campaign. And as many of you know, I am working tirelessly for Paul Gruner for surrogate court. He is running against Mary Work, who is a currently a family court judge. Paul sits in the surrogate court. He was appointed by Governor Pataki, and he was a guest on a previous show of mine which I hope all of you will see, because you will see why he is supremely qualified and why he is supported by people on both sides of the aisle. Anyway, with that, Dell, I really am pleased that you took time really out of your busy day. You were on your way back to Manhattan when I asked you, actually begged you to come <laughs> be on this show because I really uh, respect your work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you have found in the courts, uh, the family court in Kingston, what your experience has been there. Because well, I was a litigant there, as many of people know, yeah. and it was a very unhappy experience. Right. Uh, I saw your letter in the uh, Woodstock, uh, Woodstock Times, and I was really amazed at, uh, at how uh, forthright you were about your experience there. Um, my experience in the family court has been, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the fact that I believe there's just too much power there. There's just too much power with the judge. It's not. You know, you have the criminal court and you have uh, a jury. Now you have the family court and the judge is the supreme, makes all the decisions. And sometimes what I have found is that judges, you know, they're vulnerable and they could be easily fooled by the, the deceiver. The deceiver that, you know, it's not to say that both litigants don't try their hardest to make themselves look good and make the uh, uh, other side look, uh, look bad. But sometimes the judges can be tricked by... Well, not only... Uh, it's not just that the judges can be tricked, but the, ta the, the playing field isn't an equal one. For instance, uh, many of you saw John Hurd's good friend Howard Nash on my show. Howard Nash was married to a, an attorney in the Queen's Courthouse. And he had to go before a judge in the Queen's Courthouse, who was virtually a colleague of his wife. Now... Howard Nash may, is a school teacher who makes a modest income. His wife makes a, a great deal of money as a lawyer in the Queen's Courthouse. But because she was on maternity leave, they computed the child support that Howard would pay this woman based on her time not working. So he was paying her based on his salary and her income was zero. When she went back to work after her maternity leave, they refused to raise the child, lower the child support, and in effect have her actually, you know, maybe even pay him to, because it was so une unequal. But mm -hmm. again, that is like, for instance, what you're saying is, uh, and in my case, 
I was in Ulster County where the judges aren't as sophisticated as they are in Manhattan about financial matters. My ex-husband ran a tax shelter department at a conservative brokerage firm in Manhattan for, for years. Uh, needless to say, he knew about the tax laws and showed very, very little personal income, and yet his assets were huge, and his tax return didn't reflect his personal uh, state. But that's not an excuse for a judge, because a good judge, someone who is a thinking judge and knows how to deal with financial matters, that kind of judge would delve a little deeper into the tax return and, the, and see, based on what his performance was, his job and that, yeah. how to, so that's, that's what I'm saying. The, but the it, doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. I know. It well, that's what I found way. out. Well, because, well, first of all, when you're in a, you have a trial situation and you're supposed to present the evidence, the judge isn't supposed to delve behind anything. The judge has to look at what the evidence that's presented to, her, to him or her. So it's not a question of them looking in the background to find it on No, but own. I, I don't mean background. I mean assets were listed. Yeah. How could somebody have $70,000 in credit card bills in a year that they pay off in a timely manner and be earning $6,000 oh, a year? That makes no now, sense. Now, okay, I but mean, that, that was, that was that's actually, outrageous. well, yeah. but that's what I'm trying to say, that okay. that was exactly what was happening. So okay. I guess my, my question to you is, um, when, how do you deal with these inequities? In other words, you're a lawyer, let's say you were representing me, or you're re representing someone like me, or you're representing someone like Howard Nash, and the tables are so unequal. How do you turn them? We need the table. Well, I'm, I'm earning, the money that I earn is shown on my tax oh. return, and the, the, the fact that Howard is a school teacher, he gets a tax return. So how do you go into court and represent a litigant like me or Howard against somebody who is much more financially astute or who's an attorney themselves? That's what I'm asking. Well, the, 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 the cards are stacked against you, but I, I have to say, as far as I'm concerned, the system has to be scrapped. Okay. The whole, entire system. I mean, I, I, I can't say uh, this is what you should do or this is what you shouldn't do. What you should do, what we should do, is there should be a new agency. We have to have a new agency. You have to take... What do you mean a new agency? A new agency. You're getting a divorce, you go into okay. a, a you, not a family court. You go and or Supreme get the court. family court, you get the Supreme Court. You have an agency, like you have the Social Services Agency. It's an administrative body. Now, in that administrative body, you have all the facilities. You have, you have, uh, you, you have lawyers, because you need to have lawyers there. You have a psychologist there. You have people who would have been a law guardian, but they're, uh, they're uh, concerned about the children. And there's a panel of experts who are know all the aspects of the case, not just what's brought there by the litigants who hide the and deceive, or the lawyers. What are they doing? They're, they're trying to evade, they're hiding, they're deceiving, they're cheating, they're lying. All of these things well, are Well, I'm happening. glad to hear a lawyer being honest for a change. Well, isn't that what, that's the name of the game. That's just the name of the game. And what are the lawyers No doing? lawyer has sat on this show in the six years I have invited lawyers to come and said what you just said. Uh, now, the litigants have said it. Because but, we, uh, you know, but so if, if you, if, if this is a problem. The truth is that that's exactly what goes on. Lying, cheating, stealing, and hiding. That's it. That's the, that's the name of the game. And the, and the problem is that, um, and the, the lawyers have a, first of all, there's a conflict of interest between the lawyers and their clients. Why? Because the lawyer will drag out the case. I'm not going to say all oh, the lawyers, of course, that's ridiculous, but a lot, a great majority of the lawyers. And this is what drives me crazy, and this is why I get so upset because I see the lawyers dragging out the cases for as long as they can mm -hmm. possibly drag it. Why? Because first of all, if they get a retainer, if somebody gets a retainer for $7,500 or $10,000 or whatever it is, and they try to get the maximum amount of retainer that they mm -hmm. can get, why? Well, they're not going to ever settle the case before that retainer is up. I you see. better believe that. Really? They are going to make sure that they have billable hours for that retainer, regardless of what. Now, I was talking to Phil Schatz before, and he said that he Now, Phil Schatz, just for those of you who didn't see the first half of my show or previous show, Phil Schatz is, was a senior partner at McCabe and Mack. He is now um, of counsel or semi-retired, but he was my custody attorney. He's an excellent attorney. Yeah. Excellent. What did he say? Well, to what he what he told me was that he represented the richest person in um, 
uh, in Dutchess County or at that time. And he said that he charged him $450 because what he did An was hour? No. You mean for the whole total, case? For the total? For the whole case because he was able to resolve it. It so happened that he's the type of lawyer that will resolve a case and the person, his adversary, was also the, uh, was willing to do that. So they were able to resolve the case and it was a $450 settlement. Now, that's my kind of guy. Yeah. But the, but the well, I'm glad I picked, I'm glad my custody attorney was the right cho choice yeah. and I can't say that about my divorce attorney, yeah. unfortunately. So, so that's what happens. But as I said, if you had this, I, I, I envision this agency where everything comes together, where you have the Child Protective Service right there at the family, there's uh, right in that uh, family agency. And you take the, all the cases, all the matrimonial, all the family law out of the hands of the, mm -hmm. the judges and out of the hands of the lawyers. And I, I, see I like that. It sounds it sounds wonderful. But how would how would realistically we go about doing that? How well, would you? How, how would I do it? I would uh, the, I would propose it to the legislature. The legislature would have to obviously uh, have set aside funds for it. But I can see where the funds would come from. No, but the state legislature. I've lobbied for fathers' rights up in Albany, and the problem is. The legislators, by and large, in Albany, are by lawyers, lawyers. Right. and they make hundreds of right. dollars an hour, like right. you said, exactly. on this business. Exactly. So if we lobby these people, even if we get one honest person to take your idea and run with it, that he or she won't be able to sell it to their colleagues. Well, there has to be an uprising by the people, that's all I can well, say. How about by the litigants. Well, the, the litigants the have to demand it. I mean, somebody has to demand that well, there, there be a change. Well, you, you let me ask you something. Yeah. Would you be willing to be the lawyer, and I would uh, help you in my spare time. I do have to work for a living, and so do yeah. you. But maybe the people out there who are watching and listening to this, it's a wonderful, wonderful idea, which is why I invited Dell to come on the show. Maybe we could, we could lobby in January, which is when you go up to Albany to lobby, and try to browbeat these people into taking this on, because it's a sensible it idea. Is a sensible go, could you tell us more about it as well? Okay. You know, in, in other words, how it would work because the well, details. Well, first of all, what, how, how, the way I envision it is this. First of all, problem with the present system is that people expect to have uh, to have a controversy when they're getting a divorce. And what do they do? They look for the barracuda. They're looking for somebody who's going to fight. You're going to win for me. You're going to. You're going to. So they they're looking for a battle because they've been brainwashed to expect that. But if they have the idea, they, they realize that that's not going to work any longer. What you're going to do is you're going to have this agency, mm -hmm. and this agency and you are going to sit down and you're going to work this thing out together. It's going to have to work out. And if it does, I, I, ha I say that there probably would have to be an administrative judge in the ultimately, but uh, it would still be, uh, it'd be an, an agency situation where everything is there. Now, and, and it's like, People at uh, the legislators are talking about no fault divorce. And some lawyers are proposing no fault divorce. Well, this is a new agency would wouldn't even it wouldn't even be a question of no fault. When you say yeah, right. No when you say new agency, could we dissolve the family court? Oh, it's got to be okay. dissolved. Okay, so it would take a hammer and no, but right. So this yeah. would replace the this family would replace, court. Oh, absolutely, okay. would replace because, the family yeah. court and would replace the Supreme Court. And the judges would be happy because I don't think. Any judge likes. They don't the, like to go to they, trial. They, 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 they don't like they, to go to trial. I don't think they like the, the family practice at all. I think that most judges despise the matrimonial. Well, just to give you an idea of how much it's despised, um, when Mary Work was up for re-election, the person from family court who was running against Paul Gruner uh, for surrogate court this November, when she was running for re-election, and those terms are 10 years, by the way, um, I tried to find somebody to run against her, a Republican. Yeah. And now, and I, I believe me, I know a lot of people in the county. I couldn't find one person Who'd be who was willing yeah. to do that job. Nobody okay. wanted it. It's a hard. So one. that says something also that nobody really wants the job. Nobody wants that job. But uh, but the. I mean, she doesn't want it any longer. If presumably, if she's running for surrogate, I think. I mean, I don't know. I think it's it's just too much for one person to have to make the decisions 
um, about so many different people, and they it, it's it's be, it's virtually impossible for them to gather all the they they don't gather the information. But I'm saying what's gathered into their head is presented to them, and uh, and it shouldn't be on the basis of how the lawyer presents the case either. It's just be on the basis of all the facts that are gathered mm -hmm. by a variety of people and a variety of people making the decision. It, like the, so how would you have system. this board? Would these people be elected to this board, this group, this panel? Uh, I don't think that's necessary. So who would appoint would be, them? Well, they would be appointed just like how would how does any other? Why do they have to be appointed? By every county? Uh, every county. Every so county it would be a bipartisan. It would have nothing to do with political party. Nothing to do with political party. Because that to me that is ridiculous no, that we we have to elect judges on political party because political party. I'm voting yeah. for a Republican and I'm yeah. a re registered Democrat. John Chase is a registered Republican and he's supporting Pam Jorn who's a Democrat. Yeah. But so I, a lot of these issues on a local level have nothing to do with party but they should have something to do with merit. Right, they have to do with merit but I mean to say in, uh, uh, in any administrative agency uh, people are are hired. They're employed. Hired. By, by merit. Employed, by by merit. On the basis of, of merit. Qualifications. It's not on the basis of their politics. And why should politics have anything to do with the with the litigants in the in a matrimonial? What is what does that have to do with anything? What is politics? I had have exactly to do? I had a woman on my show, uh, a woman named Shelley Mayer who was in Paul Chica, Judge Paul Chica's court. Uh, he he took her three children away from her uh, and uh, awarded them to foster care because her husband um, well, you know, uh, there were some charges against them and he didn't want custody, whatever it was. The kids, Shelley was a very good mother. She was not, and there was nothing wrong with her. But he decided to put the kids into foster care. They were young kids. So this is a woman who has, doesn't have custody for children. Yeah. So she called me and asked me to come on and tell her story. And I said, sure, you know, go right ahead. Um, I did ask her, you know, were there any charges where you're an alcoholic, a drug addict, any of that, the obvious things, no, 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 no. What John Hurd was uh, telling me, he did some research, um, counties get money. Uh, money is funneled into a county to support the, child, the foster care system. So if a judge puts a certain amount, number of kids in foster care, the county gets money. How does that work, Del? I don't, I, no, I don't know anything about that. Okay. That sounds a little bit too far-fetched to me, that a judge would be thinking in terms of... I don't of, think... Uh, I didn't say he was thinking care. it. I don't th say he was thinking what? it, but it didn't make... We were trying to understand the reasoning for taking three children and putting them in foster no, care. I, I don't... I don't and and his, his, his judgments... Yeah. On uh, there's a uh, Eilenberg, a, a Mr. Eilenberg in Columbia County, who has not been able to see his kids. This was going. His name has come up over and over and over again in the six years I've been doing this show as somebody who has really, uh, for men and women, it, it, he doesn't have a preference. Uh, has has like not only taken kids away and put them in foster care, but made some pretty outrageous decisions. And what has happened is the litigants are coming forward now and speaking about this. So. I, and they, you know, because these people cannot afford to keep appealing and appealing. After a while, you get so mentally broken down and so bankrupt from paying your attorney that you just accept, you know, your kids in foster care. You can't do anything. And that's what's happened. And that's why I'm sitting here. That's why John Hurd has come on my show. And that's why these, uh, you know, presumably a lot of litigants have tried to come on. Uh, John Chase has not been able to have contact with his four-year-old son, who uh, is in Kinderhook. I might add, with the ex-wife, who was his stockbroker in Manhattan, who knew how much money he had. So, you know, you're talking about things that are going on that are blatantly unfair, well, and people, and they're happening behind closed doors, and one person is making a judgment. And sometimes their judgment not only is fallible, but their judgment is such yeah. that it is absolutely destroying families. Exactly. Is it, it's absolutely true. But uh, I, 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 apropos of that, I had a judge not too uh, long ago who gave unsupervised visitation to the father of two little kids, one little girl, and this guy has, uh, has uh, he, he's, a, I have to use the word pervert, this guy has exposed himself in public in a, in a mall, he's been arrested like four times, and the judge thought nothing of, so... Is this, this is a Hudson amazing. Valley judge? Yeah. 
And that's can you it. say who uh, it is? Well, also, no, I'm not going to tell you who it is. But I'm telling you that this is what happened. But why now, won't you say who it is? Shouldn't everybody in Ulster County know who it is? I think they should. Well, I'll tell you what happened, though. Uh, there was a, a forensic evaluation. Now, what my client said is that the forensic evaluator, she thought he was like 12 years old because he probably didn't have very much experience. But her husband has multiple years, like 15 years worth of experience with psychiatrists, so he knows exactly what to say. So he knows exactly what to say. So he Yeah, but what, what about say. an arrest record? How do you... How he do has you four arrests. For so what is the forensic psychiatrist? Public. Okay, so what? Here we go. Now so the forensic the psychiatrist. Situation? Okay, the forensic psychiatrist, and I have very little respect for a lot of them. Uh, Steve Silverman. Well, they're not really psychiatrists. They're no, they're psychologists. Psychologists, yeah. Steve Silverman has come on my show. He is one of the forensic psychologists, and he he's happens to be ha good. fabulous. Yeah, I'm glad you good. like him. Yeah. Uh, he has a reputation for siding with men. But in in my you know my case I, that was not yeah. I did not find that to be true I think he was honest and maybe Some of them you know very good. a lot of women yeah. try to get or not a lot but there are mm -hmm. women who try to get their husbands out of the custody picture and you know women at, uh, things have worked in women's favor for many years in that regard things are changing they're, now they're changing they were yeah but uh, but oh, in any yeah. case the forensics he should be doing the forensics on everyone in Ulster County and why they don't is salary. They pay these people nothing. That's why you have somebody that looks 12 years old making a forensic evaluation on a, a, about a, a man who's a, a sex offender. Exactly. And what happened is that he said he didn't find anything. Well, he didn't find anything. Where did he look except from the mouth of the person who's trying to uh, make himself look as as good as he can possibly uh, look. And so that, what does the judge say? The judge said, well, uh, it, there wasn't anything found, and so therefore I'm going to grant unsupervised visitation and let him take the kids out of state to the, to the grandparents. Okay. But now, you had that situation. Howard Nash, a school teacher in New York City, has supervised visitation because they're afraid. And his mother, who's a Holocaust survivor and is in her 80s, has, is not allowed to see her grandchildren because the lawyer from the Queen's Courthouse, the ex-wife, accused his mother, the Holocaust survivor, of sex abuse of mm -hmm. their daughter. So here you have two situations. You have a known sex offender with four arrests having unsupervised visitation, <laughs> and you have Howard Nash, who's a doll, who's a good friend of John Hurd's, who is a friend of mine now, and you have his mother the Holocaust survivor having su can't see her kids, and he has supervised visitation. Now, I think there might be something wrong with <laughs> something, the judgment of the judges, wrong. and I think, Dell, your idea of a panel, so that if there's one person who has fallible judgment, that this would then be overruled by the other people on the panel. And how many people would be on a panel? Would well, you say five? I, I, I envision five, uh, you know, five or six people. And then, you know, maybe... Well, five, because then if five. they voted... Yeah, they have to vote. They have to vote, right. They have right? to vote, yeah. So it'll be, say, five people. But, the, uh, but, the, uh, but they have staff and they have other people. But they really get to know the litigants. Now, they're not going to be litigants any longer, but they're really going to get to know the family. They're going to know about the family. And no one's going to be able to bullshit. That's, that's the whole thing. They're not going to be able to come in here and, say, and put on this big show and, uh, and, and, and answer the questions in such a way. They're, they're, they're going to delve into the background. Now, there's a uh, recent case. This is Dr. Perricone. Did you, did you read anything about the Dr. Perricone Yes. Case? Why is that name familiar? Well, he's a, he, he's a dermatologist. And oh, he's done, right. And he, he does did the cosmetics. He, did the se he had a record of sex. Wasn't there something? No, no, I don't what, think Perricone. so. Perricone. What was it? Perricone. No. It was no. in the paper. I read uh, Well, the, what, I, what I read in the paper is he's in there in Connecticut, and he's in the midst of a divorce. And within, like, three weeks, his, uh, uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but within a, a few weeks, the uh, his council fees had already gone up to two hundred thousand dollars. So the Why? judge, well, I don't know. Whatever his lawyer was charging four hundred fifty dollars an hour or five hundred dollars an hour, and the and, and the judge awarded, I believe, the wife an equal amount. But that same money could go into the agency, and then they they don't have to be paying the lawyers who have a conflict and who want to 
to uh, drag this case out as long as they mm -hmm. can. I have I have a couple of other issues I just wanted yeah, to mention. Right just, uh, just to mention about uh, what how I feel. I got uh, a couple of things on my agenda here. The other thing is is about the uh, judges who are are under an ethical cloud. You know, judges who have charges pending right. against them or the the the. the, the uh, uh, the Judicial Committee has uh, brought conduct, some, judicial uh, conduct. The Committee right. on Judicial Conduct has uh, uh, has brought some charges against them. Now, I'm a firm believer in uh, in uh, being uh, in the presumption of innocence until you're proven guilty. I, there's no right. question in but my mind. But Judge about that. Garson in Brooklyn was accused of taking bribes in matrimonial cases. That remember that? Right. Well, so you I remember it. I, I, okay. I know people who are intimately involved okay. in that. And, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. you're talking about that kind of thing. I just want to I'm make it clear. I'm talking about that kind. Of, I'm talking about that kind of thing. I just want to make it clear. A lot yeah. of people, Dell, out there who watch this show, have never been in court, and they don't. Yeah. They they assume like I did that it was right. very fair. But did she? In that case, there were criminal charges that he's been charged with criminal charges, so he's been removed from the bench, or he moved. Right. I don't know if he got off the bench himself, or well, his was so blatant. His was his offenses were so blatant. Right. But there yeah. are many more judges who are accused of more subtle. Right, but then, but in that case, if they're if they're under an unethical uh, an ethical cloud, it seems to me that. That, like the teachers and the board of ed, who and the principals, when they have charges against them, even though they may not, they've not been proven to be guilty, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are still sitting in the courtroom or sitting, uh, you know, in mm -hmm. the principal's chair. They remove them and they put them in some other place, you know, they continue to right. pay them, whatever. And I think that that should be the same thing with the judge. I think the judge should sit anywhere but on the bench when he has an ethical cloud because. I, uh, you have a responsibility to your client now. You have a client that is, this judge is going to make a decision about. You know, probably the most important decision of this person's life. And they're sitting with a cloud over their head. They say, how much faith does our, our clients have in a system where the judge continues to sit on the bench like that? I, I don't say that they're guilty. I just think that for their own sake, for the greater good of, uh, of the society, that they would just remove themselves. Well, in Europe, in Europe, and in other countries that are supposedly not as wonderful as America, people do just that. They step down. They step what down what I down. think has happened in this country, and why 51 percent of the people in this country who can don't vote or, or do vote, you know, and the 49 percent do, is because of just what you're saying, Dell. Yeah. Just what you're saying. People have lost confidence okay. in a system that is so absurdly unjust. And, and I can have judges and lawyers come on this show and tell me about what a wonderful adversarial system we have here. There's, it is flawed, and people like you are trying to make it better. And my hat goes off to you, and I, I love it. I just want to tell you that I'm a, a member of the International Alliance of Holistic Lawyers who believe in collaboration rather than... But I, I don't get a chance to do that all the... I don't get a chance mm -hmm. to act that uh, to, in a way to try to collaborate with my adversaries because it's doesn't work? Well, because it is an adversarial it's system. It's an adversarial system. Ralph Beisner, every time he comes on my TV show, the, re, the Supreme Court judge who retired two years ago in Dutchess County, he will always start off by saying it is an adversarial system. But it doesn't have to be. But if thank you. Yeah. only, it shouldn't be. But thank you very okay. much for coming. Um, our time is up. You can hear the bell ringing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really appreciated your sharing this. And uh, very often, you know, people say, I have complained outrightly and, and relentlessly about the system and it's a pleasure to have somebody come on my show and actually tell something that could be done if enough of us citizens get together and go to Albany to make the system work better. Thank you and good night. Thank you.
thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's really a lot of fun. It starts off Christmas the way I like it. All right, now thank you. Thank you. Just wonderful. Uh, the way this works is the kids get the food first. Okay? Now we're going to sing a little song, and they're all going to walk out of here. And the adult choir is welcome to walk out with us too if you'd like, but after the kids leave. Alright? Ray, can you use that clarinet? Is it still there? Can you give me a concert C? Alright? Sing, sing. Right? You know what we're going to do, guys? Alright? We're going to keep singing while these guys leave, so everybody stand up. Sing, go.